Well, again, I appreciate y'all coming today. This is the fourth module of it. Module four, part one. Healthy nutrition of this health-based lifestyle class. And this is where we, we make decisions in our life on a daily basis that do more than you think to sabotage <laughs> more than help us. Because uh, not many people eat as healthy as they should, healthy as they could, and that's a lot to do with a lot of things in our life. So this is, again, part four, or module four, part one, healthy nutrition. Quick, though, review back what we did in the last, the last module, which was healthy mindset. Uh, thing to realize is your, adicet, your attitude steers your mindset. Good habits lead to better results. The short feedback loop, we talked about that last time, uh, helps build motivation and to track your goals, enjoy some success. So think about that, the motivation and your attitude comes right along with you in everything, everything part of our life, including this chapter of healthy nutrition. It's eat to live or live to eat, which is it? Live. Do we eat to live or do we live to eat? <laughs> Foodies live to eat. <laughs> Most people have to eat to live. So you, you find out a little bit about yourself how you answer that question. So it's, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, but it's the base of what it is. We all eat. We need to eat to live. And we love to eat. So how much do you love to eat? That's the question. Yeah. Do you feel better? This is important. Do you feel better and energized after you eat? Or do you suffer from after dinner guilt and regrets? All of the above. All of the above, right? If, if, you, if you ate healthy, you should feel energized after you eat and feel, wow, I feel good to go. If you go into food coma, you probably ate so much carbs that your body's making a quick adjustment by flooding your gut with blood to help digest all that food, which makes your mind kind of woozy, and guess what? You get sleepy and tired. It's a natural biological reaction to what we eat and how much of what we eat so that's an important thing to think because it's going to go along with what we talk about here <clears throat> again our relationship with food that steers it if you eat to live you're going to most likely eat healthier than if you live to eat if you love to go out and eat and all the good stuff and the and the cheesecake and all that kind of stuff then you have a difference so it's that struggle between eating to live and living to eat that relationship we have with food that really steers how we go, how our attitude is. So you figure out what your relationship is, and we'll get to that. We'll find more about that. But social pressures drive your attitude. You see commercials. You see this. Eat this. Eat this. It's all over the Internet. It's all over TV. And that changes and adjusts your attitude more than you think. You say, oh, my God, I can never eat like that. Or I want to eat something else, this or that. So then it adjusts your attitude. So when you get a, a sour attitude or not a real upscale attitude towards something, it, it affects your mindset. Because now, long term, mindset's long term, you're like, I'm never going to be able to eat healthy. I don't know what to do, how to do it. So I'm not going to have a good mindset. So that mindset dictates your habits, your, your nutritional habits. And those habits control your nutrition. So what do you do? How do you fix it? You control your habits. We talked about that in earlier modules about our, our, our patterns, our habits, our rituals. These are the things that steer our life. And most of the time, we go along on autopilot and we don't have any control over it because we don't mindfully make decisions about a lot of those things. So we have to control our habits to help our nutrition. We have to create new habits that will support your nutritional needs and a healthier lifestyle. So pizza night three days a week is not a good habit. Pizza night once a week used to be regular in my house. It's now every three weeks. So we've got back on our pizza to once every three weeks. But I love to have that pizza night. So I understand it. But you have to make sure your habit supports your nutritional needs. So you need to create. We talked about the habit tracker in the last module. Create a habit tracker for your nutritional patterns. You've got to go over what you do, and we'll get to that with the journal, is how you de determine what your patterns are. What are your 10 go-to foods? We all have a certain 
meals menu that we go to a lot. And that causes, so that's our pattern, that's our history, that's our habit. So it could be a good habit, you may be eating good healthy food, or it could be a not so good habit that you're, you're, put, you're setting yourself up for consuming too many calories, and especially too many calories that aren't good for your metabolism, because everybody's metabolism is different. Everybody reacts to food in a different way. <clears throat> Solution for this is know your nutritional requirements. Make sure that they support life and your lifestyle. Then you reverse engineer your nutrition. So you figure out how many calories it is, what is your, your nutrients you need to have. Now let's create the menu, let's reverse engineer it. Create your shopping list and execute it. You, you design your nutritional plan just like your fitness plan when we talked about it. What is our goals? We go from our problem, solution, goals. We got our goal. Go, come on in. Seat in the back, or you can. Okay. Uh, so you design your nutritional plan like your fitness plan. Your outcome is what we're looking for. So we identify our problems, we implement a solution, we execute that plan. Bingo. Simple as that, folks. It's not hard to do. You just got to set yourself up with good habits to do that. So again, outcome. What is our outcome? We want optimum health and energy. The problem we may have is that we don't know how to do it. We have unknown needs. We don't know what our macro and micronutrient profiles should be to get you healthy. So we need to new and better habits as part of the solution and execution, plan the menu, shop the menu, prepare, enjoy, and thrive. It's simple as that. It's not a difficult thing. Once you look at it and you get the paperwork out, you get the tools at your disposal and use them, you create a new habit quicker than you think. And before you need it, you'll just automatically start creating a healthier menu for yourself. <clears throat> so the problem, a bunch of the problems may in your way is knowing what really healthy foods are. A lot of people have misconceptions about what a really healthy food is. You don't know what your nutritional requirements are. You don't have an idea what your current diet is. You know, you know what you eat, but what is that? What type of diet is it? Is it a meat potato diet? Is it a high carb diet? Is it high in fruits and vegetables? Is it a Mediterranean? We all have tendencies. Some of us pick from a little bit of all the different types of diet, but those things, that type of mix and match in our diet, it can sometimes really hurt you in the long run. So you have to understand what type of diet you need to have. Uh, common belief, Again, that it costs way too much to eat healthy. Very common misconception. People go to fast food a lot of times because it's cheap. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, it's cheap. Not as cheap as it used to be. Oh, no. I used to feed a family of four on $10 at McDonald's. Not so much. Can't feed myself on $10. And that's not even good food, right? So we understand that. Um, how you can put some of those misconceptions to bed. Your problem could be you have a busy life. You have time constraints. You don't have the time to build a good nutritional plan. You have a large family. Maybe you don't have a meal plan for a large family. And it's just more, it's just you. You're living alone and you don't know what to do. I've had many people in these types of classes who were, were suddenly cooking for themselves and hadn't a clue what to do. They really needed help. They didn't know who to reach out to. And that's good to have a, a source that you can do that. <clears throat> so here's our solution. It's part of those problems is journaling. What you eat and how it makes you feel afterwards. That is it, folks. If you do that and you get a control on what you eat and you know how it makes you feel, you're going to know right away if it's a good diet for you. Uh, you're going you're gonna to find out by journaling what your relationship is compared to your emotions and your goals. Are you a, an emotional eater? Are you a it's time to eat type person? It's on the clock, I got to eat. Or do you wait till you're hungry? These are all different types of eating patterns that big, big importance in that. The biological, physical reactions to foods. People who have high glycemic food diets, your sugar is going to go really high, spike high, it's going to crash low, it's going to raise high because now all of a sudden you got to eat again and you go on to your favorite foods, carbohydrates, your spike high, low, and you're going to get the yo-yo up and down of your body. But you should be able to know, and it's something you have to uh, purposely think about, is what these foods do to you, and we'll talk about that. 
There is continuing glucose monitoring. Anybody heard of those? Seen those? You've seen the commercial for the thing on the back of the person's arm and they hold their phone up to it? People who are diabetics checking their sugar. Those aren't just for diabetics anymore, folks. Those are mainstreaming out there. You can get one of those for yourself and wear it for a short period of time so that you can see how a bowl of spaghetti is going to affect your sugar, how a healthy salad with a little protein in it is going to affect your sugar. That is the key. So it's a tool that's out there uh, to help you get a, a, a contact with how foods affect your biology. And again, the solution is the four cornerstone approach. It, it's keeping balance. We're not going to overdo our, our nutrition and we're not going to underdo our fitness, we're not going to underdo worrying about stress. We, you know, we're going to make sure we're all balanced out with our four cornerstone approach. If you do that in your nutritional plan as well, you're going to be way down the road and eating a lot healthier, feeling better. Part of the solution I thought was keeping it simple. We don't need a menu with 35 recipes on it, folks. We need to start out with five healthy recipes. Five. And once you get five down, you add a sixth, and you add a seven, and you work up from there. It's not like you got to go out and buy a cookbook and start cooking super differently, because nobody does it. It fails 100% of the time. Uh, I've never met anybody who said, I just went and picked this Mediterranean diet book up and I'm great as could be a year later. I'm eating all this stuff. They're lying to you. It doesn't happen that way. Unless you build new patterns, new habits to control your diet, you're not going to be able to keep it up. <laughs> you need to develop your menu and your shopping lists for that menu. Maximize your food dollars. Go into Costco and the co-ops and food programs to make sure that you can Prepare your foods as cost effective as possible so that you can reduce that belief that it's too expensive to eat healthy. Meal prepping is this something we talk about. It's important to, especially if you're cooking for one or two people, a small group, is to prepare multiple meals at one time, a food prep day, where you can cook four or five or six dinners and put them in separate compartments and get it out of the way in not much longer than it takes you to cook one meal. You can cook five or six dinners, different types of dinners. As an example, food prepping is important. There's way, many ways to do that. Now there's some new tools out there, a couple that, that I've been using and, and found it really nice, and we'll, we'll talk about those. Kitchen setup is important. Uh, making sure you have the right tools, the right utensils, the right necessarily things for storing foods that you need so that you can keep your costs down. And there are some tools and there's some must-have things that I recommend in the kitchen. We'll get to that down the road in, in the program. So again, back to the, the thrush, the, the theory behind it. It's eat to live or live to eat. Folks, it's all about the macros. It, you, you've, everybody understand what a macronutrient is? No. Protein. Carbohydrates good soluble fats. Those are macronutrients. There's micronutrients as part of each of those macronutrients. There's small little things that make up the proteins. Uh, but if you control your macros and you understand your micros, you're not going to make that balance out of whack. You're not going to be taking in too many carbohydrates and not enough, enough protein. So we'll get into understanding that. It's not for everybody. Some people are so used to uh, I just eat this, this, and that, and they don't worry about it. And, and then they don't feel good later. And they have problems, and, and they feel tired, and they have to take a nap. All these things. If you start learning how to track your macronutrients, you only got to do it for a short period of time. It becomes second nature, just like cooking a good spaghetti. You know how to do it. You don't even need a recipe anymore, right? If people have done it, it's the same way. You're just creating a new habit that you're going to be able to keep in, in your arsenal from now on. Use professionals whenever possible. What do I mean by professionals? I'm talking about nutritionists. I'm not a nutritionist. I'm telling you right now, I'm not going to give anybody a nutritional diet, a recommendations, because everybody's requirements are different. For me, it's certain. I need a certain amount of, of carbohydrates. I need a certain amount of protein in my diet. I need a certain amount of omega-3s and omega-6 good oils, good fats in my diet. It's going to be different for you based on your own, your metabolism, your particular certain health at any particular time, the medications you're on, all these things. 
make a big difference in your, in your nutritional requirements. So a professional, a nutritionist, is somebody that is not all that expensive that you need to use once or twice to set your diet up, to find out what your macronutrients need to be, and then start building that menu around that. Once you do this, you take, all, you take all the fear away, you take all the guessing away, and you now start establishing a good, healthy nutritional habit and pattern. So you learn what your needs are before you start. So it's no use going out and picking these 10 or these five new recipes if they're way too high in fats for, you, for your particular metabolism uh, or they're way too low in protein. Most people, when they get over 45, do not eat enough protein in their diet. And there's some paper got here to explain that. And I have another article I'm going to send to you about how much protein you really should be looking for. Again, it's different. I'm not going to set anybody up and say, here's a meal plan for you. This is what you need to eat. You need to be a nutritionist to do that. And nutritionists will look at and ask certain questions to figure out how they're going to best approach that. So... Here's the story right here. Chris lost 172 pounds by tracking his macronutrients. Now, this is, a, this is an interesting story. I, I always try to throw in a, in a story that shows that. This is his before and after picture. In five years. I'm just going to read it because it's important to read. His, he heard weight loss became more difficult as one got older. And being just shy of 70, he definitely found that to be true. Fortunately, he didn't give up when things got hard. And that led to another important number, 10. It signifies 10 wonderful years. His blood work when he started compared to how it is now is striking. I was on the verge of serious heart disease. There's no doubt I would have been dead much earlier in route, the route I was going but since he made the changes, he's given himself 10 more years. Another significant number in his journey is nine, the number of daily medications he's on. It's not uncommon for somebody nearing 70 years old to have numerous medications, nine, 10, 12, 15 medications. Trust me, just being on those medications adjusts your nutritional requirements. It makes it different. Certain foods you're not going to be able to process as well if you weren't on certain medications. They really affect your metabolism. So by tracking them, you can get a number on this. Today, he's on zero medications. So by getting healthier over a period of time, you're going to do less and less your reliability or necessity to be on certain med medications. He was always the biggest kid growing up. In football and serving army, kept his weight controlled. He managed to stay around 240 pounds through regular exercise. Then at age 45, he blew out his back. Not uncommon if you're 240 pounds to throw out your back. <laughs> you're going to be doing things not as efficiently as you were younger. When you're less weight, you're going to hurt your back. So his whole life changed when he threw his back out. <clears throat> he was scared to death to do anything. He stayed on his couch for nine months and ate too much. And although his back eventually healed, his sedentary behavior, habits, and overeating habits stuck. Plus, increased his consumption of alcohol. And once he hit 65, he was at 412 pounds. So in from 240, which is a big person. Yes. A big person. I'm 220 pounds. He was 240 in the military. And that's common common practice but he went up to 412 pounds he was at his crossroads he needed to do something or he was going to die he needed to get back in shape he felt there was only two options he chose the second one to get back in shape his first step in his weight loss journey was talking with a dietitian again a nutritionist to get a handle on those nutritional requirements his macronutrient macronutrients if weight is not a big problem and you're not looking to drop a lot of weight, it's still may be important to get an idea about what your macronutrient profile is so that you know you're doing yourself in the long run other than weight. You may have, have a, a exceptionally fast metabolism for your age and you're able to eat. You know those guys, they eat, 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 and they're skinny as rails their whole life until they throw their back out and then all of a sudden they're 412 pounds. <laughs> so th there's a reason they need to do this. The dietitian helped to formulate a nutritional plan. It included not just a daily caloric goal, but also a detailed macronutrient target. He has never tracked protein, fat, and carbs before, so he downloaded 
MyFitnessPal app. There's a lot of, the point is there's a lot of apps, there's a lot of tools out there you can use to help you track these kind of things. And, and once he started using his MyFitnessPal app, it all started falling in line. Even with the, the use of his MyFitnessPal, he faced a large setback when COVID-19 hit and a knee replacement had, had to be rescheduled. After getting down to 240 pounds in two years, he stopped tracking exercises, and guess what? He found creep back up to 365 pounds. Consistency, consistency is the key. Avoiding those setbacks is what, what you're really trying to do. So he used the My Fitness Pro app, Pell app, to track his macronutrients, and then his diet fell in line. He's lost 172 pounds, and he's not done yet. So he's down from that 300, 365. So he wants to get low. So this is a gentleman, as in all the stories I talk about, who, who just decided he needed to make a change, and he made the appropriate change. He started, for him, it was tracking his, his macronutrients. Folks, think about this. You're not going to lose weight in the long run by over-exercising. You can't out-exercise the fork. I tell you this all, I tell people all the time. It's never been done. The only people who come close would be marathon runners and long-distance swimmers. The Michael Phelpses of the world who eat 20, 30,000 calories a day because they're burning so much off in the pool. Yeah. That is the rare case. That is elite athlete type people who are able to do that. You and I can't do that. We can't out -ex Each one of those forks in the plate is going to be 60, 70, 80 calories. So just think about doing the math. If you keep going back in the trough, you've got a lot more calories you have to burn off. So. You know, it, it's an it's important concept, macronutrients. <laughs> so the first brick is the food journal. Who keeps a food journal? Anybody keep a food journal? How often? Every day. Every day. How long have you been doing it for? Several years. Several years? You found it beneficial? Yes. It controls my sugar. Controls your sugar. Again, perfect example of why. She knows what she's eating in advance. So... <clears throat> Here's a, a perfect example, I, I've got some things on the desk there, of a food journal. There's a lot of things out there. This is one I got off of Etsy on the internet. There's t you go to Etsy, you, there's hundreds of these types of things. All different examples of what you can use. And you can fill these in online, you can take them out, print them on paper. And, and I chose this one because of what it does. It, it puts in the emotional relationship to food and also with the bio, logical response to food. It says, hmm, I ate meal one, what I ate, a bowl of cereal for breakfast, some fruit. Why? It wasn't because craving, because I was scheduled, right? It wasn't because I needed fuel, bored, social eating, or starving. It could be you're starving, you get up in the morning, your first meal is to break the fast, so you may be extra hungry. So you mark that down. What is your mood? You know, what is your mood before and after? Two to three hours after. I tell, that's a key. That's the thing that people don't put a connection to, is how you feel after you've consumed your meal. Does it make you energized, you know? Does it make you tired like we talked about? Are you over-consuming carbohydrates and getting into the food coma state? I get there myself, because it's a struggle for me as well as for anybody else. So this is a perfect example of a food log. There's many of them out there. I've got others that are available. Here's a, here's a, a different type of food log, okay? Breakfast, carbs, sugar, this one helps you track your, your macronutrients. How many total calories, how much protein, carbs, fat, and sugar. Now you say, that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's really not. If you do it once, you do one meal, and you know what that meal is. You do it once. You know it's going to be the same the next time. They didn't add calories to it. So you just got to do it once for whatever meal you do. You got to do a little bit of research. And there's document. There's things on the Internet to show you what. And I have one. It's right there on the table. It has some of the uh, caloric requirements. Macro guide. Again, if you're having steak, you have a certain type of steak, you can okay, six-ounce steak. How many kick calories? And you can build your, that, your yeah. list of your macronutrients. So that when you go back, you can plug in, okay, I had steak for dinner. It's how many calories? Boom. Do it a couple of times. If you, if you start doing these for a while and you fill out these, these macronutrient logs, 
you're going to get a handle on it pretty quick what you eat. The, 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 you know, the, the outlier, you know, that cheat meal, which is not a cheat meal. It's a necessary additional accumulation of calories because most people who stick to a strict diet slowly cut their calories, slowly cut their calories. He was talking about intermittent fasting earlier. It's a very popular thing to do. When you're in intermittent fasting, you're going a certain amount of calories, then boom, you eat nothing for 12 to 15 hours, whatever it may be. Your sugar is going to drop. Boom, you got to eat again, so the sugar is going to come back up again. So there's a response to food. You got to know what they are. So we track these things. You know how you feel after you eat. You write the macronutrients down once, and you have that number from now on. So that's the first brick of the healthy nutrition, is getting a food journal. I recommend people do it for at least 30 days. There's one down there that has a, we it's a weekly chart rather than a, month, a daily chart. So you can do a weekly meal plan, a weekly food journal. Track, if you track yourself for 30 days, you're going to get an idea about what your diet normally is, what your nutritional is, what your favorites are. You know, we've got the favorites. Pizza Friday, you know, favorites, you know, whatever it may be. We're going to stick to it. And I tell people, don't change your diet because you're cheating yourself. You know, if you go for a month and you write things you think you should be eating, not what you actually eat, you're not going to be able to get a good uh, feel for yourself to help you out so you know what to do in the in the future. So the second brick, again, it's knowing those food requirements. How many calories should you eat? I put this out, I sent it to you. It's just a basic thing. It's like the American Dietetic Association says 2015 men and women in their 60s should eat 2,000 calories. Strive to eat around 1,800 if you're not active, 1,600 if you're active. So these are generic figures. Boulder Dash, I say, Boulder Dash, don't listen to those. Because that is for the general healthy population, not necessarily for uh, over 40 population, just the average people. So they've come up with certain things. If you're moderately active, 1,800 calories. You should be able to walk between one and a half to three miles a day. So these are just generalized statistics that are out there, how much you should eat. <sighs> what if you're still gaining and losing weight? Who's, lose, who's eating less and gaining more weight? Happens to a lot of people. And you say, why is that happening? It goes on starvation. Your body will go into starvation. If you cut your calories, the first thing your body does is say, ah, I'm starvation. <clears throat> Start burning off the muscle and keep the fat. We got to store the fat, store the fat. So that's why an intermittent fast is a short period of time. It's not a week when your body goes into that. You have a short period of, of, of fasting, which helps kick that, that metabolism. So it doesn't go into the starvation mode. It doesn't start shutting down. I'm going to stand on a limb here. I say, if you want to lose weight, you need to eat more. You need to eat more. It's counterintuitive to what you think. But if you eat more, you're going to fuel your body better so it can get more things done. So you're able to burn calories off and burning the right calories, burning the fat out of your body the unproductive weight that we carry around with us. It doesn't do us any good. So our body's really good at starvation because if you starve itself, yourself, it's going to start doing that and you're going to gain weight, especially when you start eating a little bit more because you've been starving yourself and your body goes right to the fat stores. It says, I need to rebuild those fat stores up by progressively eating more and progressively increasing your exercising, you're going to lose weight. It's a fact, it's been proven, you know, for many, 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 many years. I've seen it so many times in people I've worked with. I tell them, start eating more. What is your diet? When they do their food journal, they come up to you, I'm eating 1,400 calories a day. Now, that's not enough to sustain that. You need at least 2,000 calories. You need to increase your calories by 600 quality calories, not empty fat calories that aren't doing any good. Good quality calories, some good quality vegetables, good quality nuts with the right kind of omega oils you need. So you, you have yourself energized enough to feel better, to do more work, and in the long run, you get where you're going to. So I put this up there because they're all fine and dandy as rules of thumb, but it's not necessarily the same for you. How many and what type of calories should you eat? Again, generic answer here, but pretty close. Protein, 
Now this is this is just just recently got this. It replaced what I've been using before. It says protein. How much protein? If you're over 50, you need more protein than you think you are, than you need to be. Your protein strengths in skin boosts your body's defense against illness and keeps your hearing sharp as you age. I find most people eat way too less protein as they age. Now, protein is, is a mixed bag. That's a macronutrient state. But you get into the, the micronutrients part of it by eating better. How much protein? 0.36 grams per pound of body weight. What the heck is that, right? Who's gonna weigh, who knows what 0.36 grams of protein is, right? Again, this is, when you get to somebody who is, who's really on a, on a heavy scale and they say, I need to really do something, you need to track it to that number. But for the general population, I go, play it by ear, you know? I say protein should be the size of the palm of your hand, whatever you're eating. Size of the palm of your hand, that's a, that's a serving size appropriate for most adults. Most adults, okay? Most adults. Some people have bigger hands because they're bigger people. Right. <laughs> but for most people, that's just a perfect example. But if you're trying to get, now here, a medium chicken breast, a cup of Greek yogurt, and two tablespoons of peanut butter. That's 0.36 grams of protein. That's if you're, oh, and you need more. So you can see, most people need to eat more protein. If you don't even know what you're eating, how do you even know if you're eating that enough or not? Again, back to the journaling. Back to, let's figure out what you're eating. See what your diet's mostly of. Poultry and eggs. <sighs> Protein, right? Chicken breasts that I go to for many people. They're inexpensive, cook fast, and have 25 grams per three ounce serving. 25 grams, okay? So palm size is almost six ounces. So if you eat a palm sized piece of chicken, you're gonna get your 50 grams of protein. So you, you, you see where we're going here, is figuring out portion size. A large egg has 6 or 71 calories. Again, you can get this fine tune into what you do to, 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 to get you to your goal. But just, just look at that in, in, its, in the base age. Most people don't eat enough of that. Who, who eats a core of, of that size of protein every day in their diet? Not only once, twice, but three times a day. That's per serving, folks. That's not for the day. That's per serving. Most people don't eat protein, carbs, and, and the right amount of fats on each meal, which is ideal. Most people don't do that. So just think about that. Seafood. Again, protein, 29 grams per four ounces of salmon. I love, I love salmon. It really packs a good punch for protein for what you get. It's not for everybody. <laughs> I understand that, but it's a good option for people. It's but only four ounces, right? That's a four ounce piece, and that's really about a piece that's about this big. Sure. It's small, it's not, but it's, it's pretty good. <laughs> I buy them in the bulk from Sam's Club or Costco in a bag, frozen. They, they sell them flavored, and a really good portion control. By, by just taking one of those packages out of the freezer, I thaw it overnight, put it on the grill the next day, Boom! I got salmon on it. Almost every, every week I have a piece of salmon. Soybeans. Not people think much about soybeans, but guess what? Soy is in a lot of stuff you eat. You read the labels. There's yeah. soy in there of some, of some form. But just having, a, who has had a, a soybean? A full soybean. Do you like them? I love them. I never had one until like two years ago. I said, man, these are good. So I go buy soybeans now. Yeah, you can get them without the shell too. Yeah. I like soybeans. I, 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 I never thought I would, you know. I don't eat tofu or any of so, soy things that are made together to, you know, bring in flavors. But soybeans, a good, it's a good, good source of protein. I steam all my vegetables. I don't boil anything. I, don't, I, I will sometimes grill vegetables if I'm grilling, but I, I steam most of my vegetables. Really hot steam and just... Five minutes and microwave. Yeah. yeah, yeah, little bowl, water top, steam them in a bowl. Great way to do it. <sighs> bake them in the oven. Not such a good way. They dry out, so I wouldn't bake type of vegetables. But having enough heart healthy veggies. A cup of peas is eight and a half grams of protein. A cup of peas. That's a lot. That's a lot of protein. 
Nuts and seeds. Who has nuts and seeds in their diet regularly? Very good. Good with EPA, DHA, uh, omega-3s, omega-6s. Highly recommend. You can just take a teaspoon of peanut butter, which is, it's nuts. It's nut oil, and if you're not allergic to peanuts, it's a go-to in my house. We always have a peanut butter jar sitting on the counter with a plastic spoon in there by, and it's a <laughs> spoonful of pick-me-up. My wife is a big key on that. So a couple almonds, pistachios, cashews, walnuts. Mix them all up. One handful. A full handful of every day you should have. It's a good amount of good soluble fibers. It's a good amount of, of good omega-3 and omega-6 fats. So nuts and seeds is what you should be having on a regular basis. Red meat gets a bad rap, but it's okay for meat lovers and dairy occasional serving of beef. Meat and potatoes guy, Irish. Mom was German, English. We had meat and potatoes, casseroles, nine out of 10 days a week. <laughs> and sometimes it was breakfast, dinner, and the next day. Too. <laughs> My dad sold food. He was a food broker back when they had such a creature back in the day. So he would come home with all kinds of sample boxes. We had, we had pasta in our house, so my mom had to find ways to make 48 different types of pasta meal, you know, casseroles. So we had, a, we had them all. A three ounce portion of red meat gets you 22 grams, of, so six ounce. Again, the piece of your hand, about the size of your hand, is gonna give you 50 grams of protein a day, roughly. So get that a couple of times in your diet. Go for lean types like soy, sirloin, tenderloin, top brown. Watch your portion size, three ounces, about the size of a deck of cards. Again, deck of cards is thinner than most people's hands. So I go really about the size of my, my palm of my hand and about a thickness. That's what I try to get in any of my red meat portions. Dairy, eight grams of protein in a cup. Skim milk. I went to skim milk. I was the full cream milk. 2%, 1%, all the way down the skin. I'm on the way back up, folks. Leave the skim milk alone. If you don't drink a lot, leave the 2%, leave the 1%. I'm at 2%. I'm on my way back up to, to whole milk. Is good. I, I love the taste of all milks, but just the amount of uh, fatty fats in the milk. It's the good fats. It's a, uh, there are some good fats in, in whole milk. If you're not drinking five glasses a day, you're better off having a glass of whole milk unless you have a reaction to it. If you're intolerant to, to milk, that's another thing. But better to have a glass of whole milk than three or four glasses of skim milk. Skim milk, they replace the bad stuff with better stuff. <laughs> it's the one way to say it is right. So you think you're getting, yeah, you're getting Skim milk, but you're not getting the, the best thing for your buck. So I, almond milk? Is that yeah. You know how they make almond milk? They take a glass of milk and they squeeze an almond over it. Almond milk. <laughs> Pretty much is what they do. There's not a lot of almond juice in almond milk. It's very little bit. And it spoils rapidly, so it gets rancid quickly. Any of those milks, oat milk, it sinks. You might like them. I stay away from them myself. I, I don't have much milk. There are certain things I have milk with, like my, my oat cereal or something. You know, that's about it. And when I have anything, chocolate, I got to But that's about it. We, we, very, we used to drink a lot of milk in our house. We're really down. But that's just by choice. Uh, but dairy is not bad for you if done in moderation. Again, some people like the, the soy milk and the other milks that are out there. Uh, I, I just don't, I'm not a big fan of them myself. Protein drinks. Anybody have a protein drink on a regular basis? Maybe a boost or an insure or something like that? I use them all the time, folks. It's a great way to get extra protein in your diet. Between meals, you're going to get a hunger, you need to get some extra protein. They sell those protein drinks, the, you know, the boosts and the shares from, from 15 grams to 20 grams to 50 grams you know, of, of protein in them. So you can get yourself a nice little boost of, of protein with some of the protein drinks out there, just the pre-made ones. And if you buy in bulk, they're not that ex expensive per serving. Or get a powder and, and make it yourself. So you can buy a, a big bag of protein powder uh, and use it. I used to be a big fan of protein drinks when I was bigger and was trying to hold more muscle size than I am. I used to have a lot of extra protein. I used to triple the amount of protein that most people take. 
to help support your muscle because that's what your protein does. It helps keep your eyes good, helps your protein, or helps your muscles stay good. So these are things you should eat. Th that is healthy foods. Those are 10 things that are healthy foods in your diet. So you got to find a way to use more of those and less of the chips and the things that aren't so good for us anymore. Um, and it's all, again, about creating those new habits we talked about at the beginning. If you create a new habit, you do a tracker, you find out what your habits are, you find out which, why you eat this, when you eat this, are you emotional eating, are you angry eating, are you starvation eating, they're all different. We eat different things when those different emotional come to us. So you gotta, you'll be able to track them. Use the tools and use your professionals to find out these things for yourself. Here's some things that are available. For, I didn't realize there were so many. The, the, the continuous glucose monitor, CGMs. This is a company that sells them that you can, you can buy. NutriSense. I found one and all of a sudden I found 10. There's like 30 of them out there that sell those things that you can get locally at any CVS and things like that. Just an option some people do. Uh, using glucose monitors because like I said a certain amount of carbs to you maybe may affect your sugar differently than me so you got to know how it affects you and some people get really jittery when their sugars get low I get jittery like that I can tell when I need to have me a piece of candy or some kind of sugar because you then the more you stay in tune with your body's reaction to foods the more you become a key to aha uh -huh, that's why I'm not feeling good I, my sugar is probably low you know, and if you have one of these types of things, you can you can track to, to really solidify that answer for yourself. So you're not eating like when I have my piece of cheesecake, I, I can see what my sugar goes to. <laughs> it goes high. <laughs> I don't need a glucose monitor to know that. But that's a, one of those things that you don't eat very often. Okay. Inside Tracker. This is another tool that's out there. This is a company that if you, if you do any uh, following of anything in longevity space, how to live longer, Inside Tracker is like the preeminent Mercedes Benz of systems that are out there. This system is that you send in some blood and it tells you what type of diet you should eat based on your, your chemical makeup because it's different for everybody. And there's different tools that they have. There's uh, iPhone apps, there's apps for Android devices, all these things that they use to track your, your blood. Because I'm a big promoter, we talked about it in the foundation, is know your numbers. Know what your sugar is, know what your cholesterol is. Know all those particular important numbers that you need to know for, for health. This type of company tracks that for you and it sends it right to your phone or right to your smartwatch if you have whatever it may be. These things are all tools that are out there to help people if that's something they're looking for. It's not for everybody. It's not for most people, but it's for people who are really trying to hone in if they got a health issue where they're really trying to improve their health substantially, use these types of tools. They give you a personalized nutrition plan combining blood testing, DNA, and fitness tracking. I know people who've used this who have made, like that gentleman who lost 172 pounds tracking his micronutrients, use these types of tools, just help them stay on track. You know, if you don't have a coach, somebody that's looking over your shoulder and saying, you need to do this, you don't need to do that, you need to do more of this and less of that. These types of tools are out there that people can use to help them. Like I said, they're just tools. And if you don't know how to use a tool or you don't use it often, it's not going to do you any good. So, again, it's, it, these aren't for everything, but these are, this, is, this is the wave of the future, is, is this type of biogenic type typing of your body. They're typing your blood type. They're typing your genetics. They're, they're finding ways that you need to do to hone in on your longevity, what you can do to live your genes long as possible. I talked about, you heard what telomeres are, talking about people, it's pretty common. When you're, when you're in your genetics, when your cells replicate on each of your DNA, there's these little tails, they're called telomeres. And as you reproduce and re-exchange cells, it gets shorter, shorter, shorter over your lifespan. Eventually when it, it runs out, it's the code that tells them how and what to do. When those telomeres run to nothing, guess what happens? 
Now you start getting mutated genes. This is when cancers come on. This is when people have higher prevalence of, of serious illnesses, when their body's towards the end of its lifespan because, and they can tell that by measuring your telomeres. And they can tell you where you're at. You know, where you're at on a calendar, and they can tell where you're at metabolically. And they can say you're older or younger than your age. And these are things that are possible. And, there, and by doing these types of things, you can really key in and really take charge of, of your, your nutrition, take charge of your life a lot easier than in the past. <clears throat> so again, review, part one. Determine your current diet and what it does for you. Everybody start a journal. Do a journal. You're going to get something out of it, even if it's not tracking uh, what you think, you're going to learn something about yourself. It could be uh, how you eat. Are you strictly an emotional eater or are you uh, strictly, um, I'm on overdrive, you know, or I mean, I'm on in a trance and I just do what I normally do. Who has a specific meal on a certain day every week? You know, when I grew up, my buddy Greg's house, we went Thursday, it was pasta day, and his mom made a big old pot of, of sauce every Thursday, invited the whole neighbors over, and it was a big pot. I mean, my family was steak and potatoes on Sunday. That was it. We had to have it, you know. And then the rest of the week was casseroles, <laughs> whatever my mom would make. But people eat like that. You know, they have a regular dietary uh, habit pattern, and they follow it. So by doing a journal, you're going to find out if you have any of those. And, and that's a good thing to help you with your, with your, with your health. F food journaling. This is our first brick. Doing that fur journal. Food journal. Say that five times fast. So again, we're on the nutritional cornerstone. We've got our foundation. We know our numbers. Hopefully you've done some of that work we went over in the previous modules. Now we're starting our, our fitness first module. We got that going. You know, we, we've worked on the mindset and our attitude. Now we're on the nutritional cornerstone. And we'll get to the stress reduction at the next module. So those are our four cornerstones. But if you do a food journal, you're going to find the holes in your nutritional profile. You're going to find where you need to make some put some attention at to help you out so that's our first brick that's that's what we need to do you need to start one as soon as you can tomorrow today whatever it is start one take one of those forms on the meal prep form you know the, take one of the the guidelines there take another one if there's extras make a copy if you can start tracking what you eat one day at a time folks one day at a time if you miss a day you miss a day, but try to keep with it. The more consistent you are, it's with anything else, the more you're gonna get the better results by staying consistent. Exercise programs always work better when you do it every week, not every month. Once a week, twice a week, you're gonna get more out of it. Brick number two is determining your nutritional requirements. Once you do your journal and you find out what you're eating, now you can say, how, what should I be eating? You may find out that you're not getting enough protein when you do that journal. And you track and you say, okay, this, this meal is this. It's really low on carbohydrates or it's really high on fats. You need to make an adjustment. So these are the things that you're going to learn by determining your requirements are. And I would suggest, if you know a nutritionist, they actually have them here, that they can help you out coming up with those numbers for you. And you only got to do it once, and then I say, six months down the road, let's you go and reevaluate how you're doing. Have the nutritionist look back in on you and, and see Sarah, I hope I have to know his name, I think. Uh, she, they can help track that kind of stuff, just to get you on, on course, especially if you have specific health needs. Uh, you're looking to drop weight because we're always healthier when we're leaner, except when we're really older, then it's not good to be so lean. And we'll get into that when you get to the lifestyle part of it. There's, there's statistics to prove that when you get above, say, 75 years old, it's better to put on a few extra pounds than worry about what you eat so much because it's going to help you fight off illnesses. It's going to help you stay healthy. Not too much, but just a little bit, you know. Better to be a little little paunchy when you're older than too skinny and frail. So, so are the nutritionists upstairs or possible? I don't know if she has them here. Sarah works over in the rec center. Okay. Um, there's others around. There's, there's places around this in Solon that have uh, nutritionists on staff that you can use. And just call around and say, hey, I'd like to have somebody evaluate my diet, what my needs are. And I, get it on your medical plan too. 
some, some plans do offer that kind of counseling and stuff like that as well, especially if you've got a health problem. They're going to say, yes, I'll approve that. We want to get you healthier so you're not using your health plan more. <laughs> so that's the, that's the progressive health plans out there that, who really believe in prevention, not just reactive medicine. So that's a, you know, hospitals are great when you're, when you're sick, but let's not get there. Yeah. Let's do what we can be, so we don't get there to that stage. So that's your second brick of this cornerstone is figuring out what your nutritional requirements are. Uh, and there, and again, your nutritional requirements are different for everybody. And you may have what you're, what they are now. Then you say, Oh, my goals are, I want to be here. So now what do you do to make that adjustment to get you from one to two? to get you from where you are to where you want to be. So that's where you need a nutritionist to say, okay, how do I cut this out? Doing the meal plans and the shopping list is the easy part. It's knowing what you need to be looking to put into your diet. And you can always make things taste a little better if it's too bland. You're better off eating, this is just me on my soapbox, I'm better off eating healthy food with maybe a little something added to make it a little more palatable than not eat it at all. So you know, I'm not going to eat okra. Sorry, I'm not doing it. I'm not eating Brussels sprouts. I'm not doing it, you know. But I can put Brussels sprouts on the grill soaked in butter and garlic, and I'll eat them. I wouldn't have ate them unless I put it on the grill. So same thing, you know. You, I, I personally would rather do that than to not eat that because it's just boring, bland cardboard, you know. And some people have that reaction to foods, and they stay away. I don't like the taste, you know. Soybeans. Never had them. Love them now. I'm a regular at the store. Go get me a handful of soybeans every time I go to Heinen's up the road here. So I, I, it's, it's a good thing. So those are the two bricks. That's part of this module. So that is part one of the healthy nutrition. So I'm sure everybody's got the documents there that I put there. Read the one on the walking program because we all talked about it in the fitness first. We all should be starting a walking program. There's 17 people, famous people and a couple not so famous people, that explain how they got into their walking program and the benefits it's given them. Not one of them said a bad thing about walking. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I tell people, other than eating healthier, walking every day is the second best thing you can do for your life, is to eat better and walk every day. Every day, the two, the two best things. Then we'll work on having a better attitude when you don't want to get up and walk every day. <laughs> and then we're going to talk about how you're, going to, how you're going to eliminate all that stress in your life so you feel better so you can walk every day. So these things all kind of work together. They all are synergistic, synergistic in themselves, and they work together. That's why you have to have a balanced approach. And that's what this is all about, is helping you balance your approach out to a healthy lifestyle and not just go buy a cookbook, because that ain't it. <laughs> if there's any product attached to any kind of information, I kind of take that and put it on another pile. You know, if somebody's trying to sell you a product they say is healthier, you gotta think about what their motivation is. Go to the WebMD, go to science-based websites. This is clean eating. Uh, clean eating crock pot free. This is the freezer meals that I, I did last year. I, I signed up for this program. It's freezer meals, a crock pot freezer meals. So instead of doing a food prep day where you cook everything, you do a food prep day where you put everything in gallon bags, Ziploc bags. You put your chicken, your veggies, everything in the bags, and you freeze it. Then you take it out one day at a time, and you put it in your crock pot, and you heat it up, and snap, snap, it's done. So it's just prepping without cooking. Then there's food prep days where you're cooking all the food, putting them in containers and freezing them cooked. Different options for different foods. I'm really liking this food prep with this, this, this company here. And she's- They don't send you the food, do they? No, they, here, here's what you get. Uh, okay, now here, here's a recipe, slow cooked chicken. I, I love this. I have this all the time. This is one of my favorites. I just put a slow cooker Mexican chicken soup. You buy all the stuff, plastic gallon freezer bag, you label the bag. If you belong to, you can print out the labels and you attach it to the bag. You put it all together, you put it in the freezer. And it's frozen. So then you just take it out, you put it in your crock pot, open it up, put it in your crock pot, put it on for an amount of time, and it's cooked. 
I mean, there's all kinds of, they have hundreds of recipes in, in this site, but it, it's really a good option for people. Uh, WebMD is another one for medical information. It, they have a blog and they post stuff on a regular basis, healthy articles. They're not based on any nutritional or product. It's, it's talked about, that's where I came up with that article from the, the 12, the 10 foods you should eat, came off of WebMD's blog post. So this is, you know, this is science. This is not product based, you know. So there's a lot of things out there you can do to increase your, your, your background information on anything. But this is an ex example of uh, their crock, so crock pot Mexican chicken. There's all kinds of them. Beef roast and carrots. I mean, slow cooked chicken and fajitas. Tons of things. And they're simple little descriptions. And he also, with this particular program, it prints out your shopping list. So you said you want this meal, this meal, this meal. It prints out a shopping list. You take it to the store. It saves you all that headache of figuring out what it is. And then you take it home. You put, your, you put it all in those gallon freezer bags. I... I, I came across that last year and I tried it over the winter and I really liked it and uh, we've been using that and I've got six or seven of the go-to's that I've been using there's tons and tons of options out there again it's just a tool that you can use to improve your nutrition and we get to the next part of the nutrition when we come back and revisit it the next time that's what it's all based on a lot of that kind of stuff now that you have a meal plan you know what your nutritional is you've seen somebody you know what you should be eating now, how do you build that meal plan up from there? How do you get those shopping lists? How do you go prep it, prep days? I taught at the, a class at the Twinsburg Seniors um, apartment complex on Darrow Road on 91, right up by the square, just off to the east side. It's a senior complex. And I taught an arthritis foundation exercise class there to all the people who lived in the building. They're seniors that can't get out, they don't get out very much. And, we taught a cooking class there, and I never thought they would like it. I said, let's try this. Let's do a cooking class. Everybody comes down, bring their favorite recipe. And we all came down and we shared recipes. I said, okay, we're going to do this the next time. And we're all going to come down. They have a big kitchen there. We're going to make 10 servings of this one, 10 servings of that one, and there's 10 people in the group. Each one takes home a serving. So we get to try other people's, ser other people's meals and say, hey, that made something I like. So then these people left with like five bags for different meals uh, that they could try out for dinners. And they loved it. They said, it's the greatest thing, you know, and that they never had, you know, people showing them how to do it. And it was strictly teaching people how to food prep and how to shop and everything else, you know, everybody can cook, hopefully, right? <laughs> so that, it, was, it was an easy way to get my point across to them about food prepping. Because when you're, when they, when you're interned a lot and you can't get out about, you don't go into restaurants, or you're going to be eating inside, so let's make that eating healthier and make it more supportive, make it more cost effective. Because I would see certain people at, the, at Giant Eagle in Twin Creek every day. Why am I going there every day? <laughs> Why do I go into Home Depot every other day, right? It just things happen. You forget something. Or I decide, okay, I'm, I'm going to make this tonight, and I'll buy enough for three days. And so I'll make whatever the meal. So I, sometimes I go multiple days in a week. Um, but, and it's like, why are you doing it? Well, I only cook for one day at a time. They go to the store every day, and they go home and cook. Go to the store every day and cook. You know, she was, A, it, it gets her out of the place, mm -hmm. it, which is sometimes that's a good thing. And B, she's not worrying about overcooking too much food, but she's throwing a lot away because she's not knows how to maximize that to make two meals out of that instead of one. So make a dinner and the rest is your breakfast protein the next day. I live by the breakfast protein. Last night's dinner is breakfast protein the next day. Whatever it is, whatever kind of protein is for dinner, I make enough so I have a breakfast protein in the morning. I'm having Sarah with a piece of hamburger meat or something. Whatever it is, I have some protein. You know, whatever it, make sure you get your protein in the breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Never go without protein in your diet, and you'll be better, better off for it. <laughs> Any other questions? What about leftovers yeah. as far as, you know, making enough that you could actually get two meals? Right. Uh, I cook for my wife and I, and like I said, I always leftovers. I always make leftovers, so I have breakfast protein, and sometimes the next day breakfast protein, <laughs> if I really liked it. <laughs> so, 
like if I'm making flank steak, I'm going to buy two flank steaks so I can have for dinner, and I'm going to have a couple days for breakfast protein or sandwiches at lunch type of thing. Uh, so I prepare ahead, and I, I don't waste food in my house anymore. I, it's like it's a sin to me to throw food away. You know, there's days it's it's once a week, usually leftovers day. Whatever's in the fridge, we're eating. Yeah. That's lunch and dinner. Whatever's in there, you know, we're not cooking today. It's leftover day. That way you get rid of everything, and it's only a week old. How bad could it be, right? <laughs> so, yes. Uh, I, I use it in protein shakes. I put the PB2, which is peanut butter. It's ground, dried up peanut butter. And they sell it everywhere. Now, it used to be hard to get. You can get it at the grocery stores now. PB2, take a spoonful in a protein shake, mix it up, gives you a little extra protein. And it tastes good. It's, it's, it's freeze dried, whatever, how they do it to, to make it, but it's good. When I was big on the protein drinks, I would mix my own. You know, it was frozen fruit. Apples, pears, bananas, blackberries, raspberries, whatever berries. I put them in bags. I set up bags. I have five or six, seven bags. I put them all in, put them in the freezer. I take them out, put them in the blender. No ice you need. They're frozen. Put in protein powder, a little bit of milk, and stir it up. Throw a little greens in and some pineapple or something in. Boom. PB2 would go in there. You know, soy, soy. Soybean oil, soybean oil will go in there. Before now I'm eating soybeans, but I had a little tube of oil. I'd pour it in there. Uh, it's all kinds of stuff. Put it in there, great shake. That was my breakfast for years. I had that for breakfast, and not so much anymore. I was trying to really, you know, I was 45 pounds heavier than I am now, mostly all muscle. So it was like, I, was, I wanted it. That's what I was, that was my goal, and that's what I ate for. Because you eat for the weight you want to be, not where you're at. That's a trick. Eat for weight you want to be. That was that second part of it. So, any other questions? Yes, Jean. You said you get a handful of Nuts. soy at at Heinz. What are you talking about? How do you get? A, what's a handful? Soybeans. Soybeans. They just have them in a container. Well, no, no, they have them like out when they have the carrots and all that stuff. They have soybeans. And the produce section. And they're in, oh. they have the green you can get them in in the. In the green, in the husk, or you can get them just outside, just in in bulk. And, and they just have them like yeah, that. and they 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 sell them dried as well as frozen. fresh and frozen. And frozen. Right, that I know, but I didn't know about on the. Yeah, you can fresh. you can get them. Yeah, like beans are by over by the beans, by the green beans. They're usually over that way somewhere. Soybeans. Or in the cabinets where the mushrooms are. Yeah. Salad. Right next to my favorite portobello mushrooms. You gotta have one of those every week. <laughs> Eat your mushrooms, folks. Mushrooms are very good for you. I think we'll be showing up for dinner sometime. Eat mushrooms. <laughs> Eat some mushrooms. Yes, sir. So many people say Bring that. Pie, you. So many people uh, suggest that we'll just eat until you're full. I've never had that feeling. <laughs> it's it's like it's like drinking. It's like drinking water. When you're thirsty, it's too late. You're already dehydrated, right? You should be drinking enough that you don't ever feel really parched. Because that's the idea. It's the same with eating. You know, you can eat till you're full, okay, or you can eat to the amount that you need to eat. So if you prepare your food, you know what you should be eating. You're eating on a regular basis. You never get to the point where you're over hungry that you stuff yourself till you're full. Full feeling is something you should never have. It's really not good. When you feel stuffed, like a couple of days a year, like Thanksgiving and the holidays, we'll give you a pass on those days. But for the most part, you should never eat till you're full, really full, because your stomach can hold a lot, a lot more than we mostly need. I've heard one theory on that is if you eat slow, because you don't give your body time enough to signal your brain that you're right. full. So you should and, eat and what I always do is a glass of water before I eat. Glass of water. Really? Drink a glass of water before you eat. You're not going to overeat when you got water in your belly. And that's just taking up space. And you need the water anyway. So drink, eat, drink it before. Don't drink as you eat. Drink it before you eat. Wow. Drink a glass of water before you eat. And if you need a little to get the food down, you can do that. But drink a glass of water before you eat. And, and, but n I try never to eat. If I feel stuffed, I, that's when I get the regrets. I talked about, you know, the, the coma, the food. Like, oh, why did I eat that extra piece of this or that? You know, like, because now you got the regrets. You're trying to avoid that, you know. And the more you prep and prepare your meal and your diets and all that, the less you have that. 
And like I said, once you get your train rolling, you get doing it good, then it becomes second nature, just like anything else. Well, thanks, everybody, for coming. Enjoy the rest of your day. And...